Today, I took a road trip to eastern Massachusetts. Most people visiting this classic New England area in October are either leaf peeping or visiting the witchy town of Salem. But you listeners know me better than that. I am much more excited about the brown leaves about to get into my compost pile and meeting composters like Andrew Brousseau, operations manager at Black Earth Compost. On my way in, winding through the historic streets of Gloucester, my anticipation grew as I saw so many little green food scrap collection buckets in front of the homes. I followed those buckets all the way to Black Earth's new two-acre ASP compost facility, where the contents of those little green buckets end up. This is Black Earth's fourth facility in Massachusetts. It's located on top of the town's old landfill. After the tour of the tight site that has been thoughtfully designed with the help of Green Mountain Technology, we went to Andrew's home where we sat down in his children's kindergarten chairs and spoke a little bit about his operations and a lot about the hot topic of PFAS. In fact, as I walked into his home, an NPR news story was on about PFAS and Andrew was trying to call in. We delve into how Black Earth is handling customer questions, how and why we should test for PFAS, and more. Join us. Welcome to The Composter, a podcast for compost lovers. I'm your host and fellow composter, Jane Werner. Join me in practical conversation between industry professionals and farmers with a passion for producing quality compost. We're going to dig deep into the science, technology, and art of compost production so that we as composters can help enliven the world's soils. This episode of The Composter is brought to you by Viably. As the master distributor of Comtech products in North America, Viably helps their customers to uncover the most forward-thinking solutions in the waste and recycling industry, including the proven four-step Comtech compost process of shred, turn, screen, and separate, which produces healthy, contaminant-free compost while optimizing commercial production efficiency. Viably is also the distributor of the Turbo Separator Food Waste Depackaging System and the Harp Renewables Biodigester. Both of these revolutionary machines can help composters incorporate food scraps into their compost process, creating a more nutritious end product and the opportunity for an enhanced bottom line. You can learn more about Viably and their portfolio of compost solutions at thinkviably.com. While there, request a complimentary consultative meeting to discover how Viably can help your compost operation deliver what is possible. When it comes to buying a truck, you don't look for parts and try to build it yourself. You want something ready to ride. So why settle for parts when it comes to your farm management? In a world filled with parts vendors, Farmhand is the only all-in-one virtual assistant built by and for farmers. With one single platform, Farmhand enables you to offload your administrative tasks, send and manage communications, and sell more to your customers. The best part? Farmhand's ready-to-ride platform comes with zero startup costs or long-term commitments. Ready to earn more and work less? Take Farmhand's ready-to-ride solutions for a spin. Learn more and book a free test drive at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand dot partners slash no till. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Andrew. I'm so, I'm so happy to have you on and thank you for inviting me into your home. It's very rare. I get to have an in-person podcast interview, so I'm super excited about it. Can you tell us a bit about Black Earth Compost, your role there, where you're located and, um, yeah, just anything you want us to know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks for inviting me down to Earth Care. You know, I told my son about this and he was like, oh, we're going to her pool, right? <laughs> I was like, no, she's coming up here. <laughs> but she really wants to swim in your pool. Oh, it's happening. Let's make a date. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so my name is Andrew Brusso. I'm a managing partner of Black Earth Compost. Uh, I've been with them since 2010. Um you know, I run the compost side of the business. My partner, Connor Miller, runs the hauling side. We do both the collection and the composting. Um, right now, we have four compost sites. We are focused on that, like, municipal food waste. You know, um, 
we're kind of a small volume, high value uh, model. Um, we go for like residential food waste, commercial food waste. That's kind of our niche. Uh, we haul about like 300 tons of it a week. And we have three sites. One's like a turned windrow site with an excavator. One's like a full indoor air raid stack pile that you saw today. And we built with Green Mountain Technologies. And then one's kind of like in between the two. Cool. When I was driving in here, I saw tons of little bins with black earth compost on it. So we are in the zone where you're collecting. Can you tell us about your collection range? Yeah. I mean, we collect from like Salisbury all the way down to Rhode Island. From the East Coast all the way out to like Worcester. Our model has always been to keep the cost as low as possible for the customer. Are you in Boston area as well? Yes. Yep. Okay. We're in Boston. We don't have the Boston contract and we might be happy not to have it. Yeah. But we're all around there. And it feels like you're growing. Does it feel like that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But we're taking like a more measured approach, yeah. you know, as we're like, because, you know, success can breed failure. So trying to, um, you know, make sure we're doing the right things. Yeah build intentionally. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like we just had our big build of our new facility, which I showed you today in Manchester. Yeah. So we want to like work the kinks out there and then move forward. Um, it's a two acre site and it's on an old landfill. Correct. And um, I can see your vision there. Like I, it's, a, it's exciting to think about these smaller sites placed in densely populated areas where you can really um, cut down the trucking costs of, you know, bringing materials in and having them leave the site. Yes. And the challenges that come with that of really having to manage traffic and odors and vectors of seagulls and all those things. So I see your thoughtfulness. And now you've had a couple sites to work out other kinks on. And yeah, so you're, yeah, it's, it's gonna be fun to see that unfold in the coming years. Yeah, I'm excited. And I, I can't say that like I have like the full vision. You know, people say like, aren't you proud? And I'm like, give me two years. Let me operate it. Yeah. You know, sometimes I feel like, you know, the guy at the front with the lantern kind of like trying to peer through the dark. But yeah, it's like I feel like composting is a trade off between like, you know, moisture management, like runoff problems bird problems, odor problems, and then money. Yep. And so in this situation, we've like aired on like taking a hit on money. So the, the site costs more, but we like are controlling all those other things. So, and I think that's the trade-off that you have to take when you're going closer to neighbors into that like urban suburban, like jungle, if you will. And beautiful that you got that USDA grant to help with those expensive startup costs for a site like that. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And we we got the grant and the trade was that we would give compost to farmers, specifically like we're aiming at conventional farmers to get them like using the product. So we're offering it to them for like a really subsidized price to get them started a couple of years to like see the benefits. Cause I really think that you know, conventional farmers could benefit from compost. We need to wean off of chemical fertilizer and build our soils up. And uh, I know there's a little bit of, um, just like we're learning with everything in this industry, there's a learning curve to using something new. Um, but I think I think you're right. The benefits are going to be long-term and amazing. So. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about it. I, I think there needs to be some level of funding coming in to help farmers get over that barrier and actually like try it like a lot of them don't even have the spreading equipment mm -hmm. you know so that alone is a barrier um and you know kind of backing out as an industry like as composters you know try and get that food scrap feedstock we're like up against anaerobic digestion and they have on their back end for their products they have these like markets that are like semi-government approved but like funded through carbon credits like for the gas you know composting we don't have that in the back end so they have this like driver that pulls food waste in through the digester and then they can sell you know the gas you know but we don't have that economic driver on the back end so i think one would be that um you know somehow there's money that can go to farmers to help them realize the benefits of compost. And then it's helping draw food through the compost network 
that, you know, in each state. So when we got together for that tour last time, when you came to down to Earth Care Farm, we started talking about PFAS and how many more calls we're getting in about our customers being concerned of asking us questions about PFAS. And um, I think it would be great as an industry as we if we can have these answers for everybody. Yeah. And um, and you've been delving into the PFAS issue. It's prevalent, especially in New England, um, in this area that, you know, we're, we're in an old area where there's been industry and paper mills and things like that. So we're just in a more concentrated area for that. Yeah. But um, tell us a little bit about PFAS. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess as an industry, um, I think we need to test, we need to publish results to like illuminate because right now all we're getting is like, we keep hearing about the same story of like the farms in Maine and it's not like that story is not the same where we are, but like people like consumers hear about these like farms in Maine and then they, they're like, Oh, all compost is bad. And like all local farms might be bad. Like, so that's a dangerous message. When when I walked into the house, to Andrew's house just moments ago, the NPR article that they were talking about on the news was about this same main story that's like two years old now. Three or four from 2000. 2000, yeah. yeah. Said that. <laughs> and it's a, it feels fear mongering. <laughs> like it's like, yeah, okay. So, yeah. And like that story, you know, they had crazy amounts of PFAS and most likely it came from the paper industry, you know, which there's a lot of it up in Maine, yeah. you know, so like, but that that's not food scrap compost. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, yeah, we can, that's what we want to talk about here is just like, you know, PFAS is everywhere. Uh, some things have high PFAS, some things have low. Like compost made from paper sludge seems to have very high compost. And that's what I've seen in like our comparison. You know, we have a paper on our website that like describes that and compares our compost to the main story. I, I want to back up a little bit and j just in case someone doesn't know what PFAS yeah, yeah, are. Sure. Yeah. Um, can you say what PFAS is? It's, it, it's a forever chemical and it stands for, I mean, it like, it, it's like per alkyl fluorinated something yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when and why did they originate yeah so that that's actually kind of a fun story because i i i love looking at all the trade-offs that society has made and how they benefit us and also hurt us i guess i'll preface you know i'm not an expert on pfos i've just been looking at it because i've been forced to um you know i am an earth scientist that's my background and so i know you know a lot about a little about a lot of things or some about a lot of things, uh, you know, microbiology, biochemistry, weather, geology, earth history, all that. Um, so I, I have some, like, I know the jargon of like what PFAS are. And so essentially like, um, you know, so we, we talk about like what we eat, like protein, carbs, and fats, right? So fats, fatty acids, lipids, it's like a carbon chain with hydrogens all down it, right? So PFAS is also, you know, a carbon chain, but instead of hydrogens all the way down it, it has fluorine atoms all the way down it. So it's those fluorine atoms that give it the, the great properties that we love and that like as society we asked for and like need. Like coatings on pans to keep them from sticking and a carpet stuff so we when we spill it doesn't make a mess uh, we can clean it up and i know it's in like mascara yeah. for you know so it doesn't wash off when we cry exactly so like the the two main benefits that it gives um the the like these like fat molecules lipids and like you, you use those lipids you like coat them onto something whether it's like your carpet or a couch or like a paper plate or you know your mascara like so it's put on and it stays on just like a fat would um and so the the fluorine so it, it's pfos are used as an oil and a water barrier right so that's why the mascara doesn't come off when you try because it resists water and it's like that lipid property that gives it that like water resistant um but like it also prevents it from like biodegrading and so like 
that's what we want. Like you couldn't just coat your carpet or your couch with like bacon fat because it would go <laughs> rancid really fast. Yeah. It would give you the properties that you want, you know, the water resistant properties for a little bit, but it would biodegrade and that's not what you want. So like, you know, 3M and whoever made these lipids coated with fluorine so it doesn't biodegrade. Great. You know, but it doesn't biodegrade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's so funny because the exact things that like give it the properties we want are the things that give it, give it the properties that cause problems for us. Be careful what you ask for. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing that the fluorines give it is it gives it fire resistance because mm-hmm. when those lip, that carbon chain is, you know, surrounded by hydrogens, like that can oxidize really easily, whether it's, you know, from like a chemical oxidation from a fire. Um, or the same thing, microbial oxidation. But um, that's why it's like fire resistant as well. Okay, so um, it's used in like the, the, the spray cans when you're putting out fires. And, um, and it st- was it in the 70s that, it was, that this started? Yeah. They've been around for a long, long time. I, I mean, I, th- I think they are slowly flushing out. Okay. You know, there's a whole bunch of classes of them. Um, you know, I, I call them the bad six, like PFOS, PFOA, PFHXA, and there's like three others, yeah. PFDA. Um, the, those are the ones that like, uh, you know, EPA wants you to monitor. Mass- State of Massachusetts has like a limit on them, and the limit's actually the combined of those six. You know, so those, um, I think they started to phase them out maybe late 90s, early 2000s. And like, I, there's a study, it's in our paper or referenced in there that like the um, American blood levels of those six has been decreasing since the 2000s. So they are flushing out. But like, you know, there's other ones that they were putting in, like shorter chain ones. Yeah. You know, if we stop using those, those might flush out sooner too. So, and that that's kind of why it's really frustrating when people are like, oh, we need zero PFAS tomorrow. Like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, this, we need to accept that it's going to take like 20 years mm-hmm. to like ramp it down. Yeah. And I think that's a better approach. I did hear a news story that every drop of water on on the planet has PFAS in it. Have you heard that as well? Uh, yeah, from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Yeah. 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 Like, it's in rain. Yeah. So it's like, it's impossible like to say that there is, you have something that has zero PFAS. So back to your question about like, like when customers ask us as composters what to do, it's like, well, or like, like, hey, does your thing have PFAS in it? You're like, yeah, of course it does. It's in rain. Like it's everywhere. But there's some stuff that has high PFAS and some that has low. And we've tested and compared ours to other composts, like the ones you hear in the news, and our compost is low. We've been also saying, like, we don't take in paper pulps or sewage sludge, and those seem to be highly concentrated with PFAS. I'd be careful saying sewage sludge, because, like, it's the same, like, com- compost is a process, and wastewater treatment is also a process, and baking a cake is also a process. If I bake a cake with toxic waste i made a cake that no one wants to eat you know and like so if you're in a nice town that you know doesn't have industry in it your wastewater might not be that bad you know it's gonna have some pfos in it but it's not gonna be the same amount as if it's like a town that has you know industrial base or something that's like discharging it like i think it's also used in like electroplating so I think it's mostly in wastewater sludge or some, and it, it also appears to be in like the recycled paper stream, yeah. um, but I'm not an expert. And it, I, I think it is in toilet paper too. Like you've heard those stories. And I think that's because toilet paper is kind of the end of the line for like recycled paper, right? It's like the shortest fibers that they can't reuse for like paper they it ends up going to make toilet paper so that's why it's there we just want to make sure to say here that not all toilet paper has a lot of pfas in it and not all recycled paper has a lot of pfas in it our intention is not to blame another industry but to shed light on the bigger picture
Uh, now I'm just thinking because paper's from trees. So what is added into paper? To, is it just they're adding in actual PFAS? Like, a, <laughs> like well, curious I mean, about that. No, I didn't think about that till before we just started talking. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets to like circular economy mm-hmm. questions. Like if we're going to keep these materials going round and round and round, we have to make sure that they're clean and we're not adulterating them significantly. So like, how did the PFAS get in the recycled paper stream? is probably from like food packaging that like had PFAS put on it. People recycled it. It got mixed with like, you know, all the other like post-consumer paper. And then it's just, then the next time it goes around, it's kind of there. Um, and why are they in the news so much? Like what's dangerous about them for humans? Um, I don't know. And I don't think anyone really knows. Why is it in the news? Because <laughs> someone just put, like turn the light bulb on and we all looked down and there were spiders everywhere, yeah. but they've been there for like 60 years. Mm-hmm. So it's really just, it's probably there is an advancement in like, uh, just like being able to test for it. Yeah. Um, I was talking with someone, a well-known compost, you know, matriarch, and she was saying that they were yelling about PFAS like 10 or 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, I so I will say that I I just went to the uh, BPI and the CMA conferences, you know, on compostable packaging, and like I'm proud that they took a stance, like back in the mid 2010s, to like say, look, you gotta like not put PFAS on compostable packaging. So like, you know, roads from BPI, like he stood up in 2018 and he was like, look guys, you can't, we're going to have a PFAS ban on everything certified compostable with BPI. And the manufacturers were like, hey, we can't do that. And he's like, sorry, but we have to. (laughs) And like, you know, BPI lost some people, you know, some customers through that, but it was the right move. And like, since then, you know, I followed BPI and then CMA, Compost Manufacturers Alliance, they also have a PFAS standard. And then TUV in Europe, they also have a standard. So we accept compostable packaging, but only if it's certified. Okay, BPI or the CMA. Or TUV, yeah. So I think it's it's important as composters that we hold that line. We're like, look, it has to be BPI, CMA, or TUV. Yeah, I remember that big story when um, the Whole Foods takeout containers were tested and they had PFAS and they've like... It's great that BPI was probably ahead of that story, yeah. you know, and so. Yeah, and and you, you'll you still test that stuff, and it still has PFAS. Because but, everything does. Because everything <laughs> yeah, does. Yeah. yeah. But like, yeah, we're full we, of it. we have to make a move away from it, so that's why we should. No added. Like, follow the people who are holding the flag saying, hey, don't add PFAS, and we should support them, because that's the way out. Join me and composters from around the country at Compost 2025 in Phoenix, Arizona, January 27th to the 30th, where industry leaders gather to revolutionize composting. Don't miss keynote speaker Stephanie Katsaros, president of Brightbeat, a Chicago-based organization sharing insights on advancing environmental stewardship and social change. Network with professionals, attend workshops, and explore the latest innovations in composting. Register now at compostconference.com and use coupon code NOTILL for 10% off. See you there. Oh yeah, it's seed browsing season and High Mowing Organic Seeds is releasing 66 new seed varieties for 2025 on November 1st. These beautiful and productive vegetable, flower, and herb varieties are 100% organic and non-GMO and trialed for optimal performance in organic growing systems. Whether you're trying to bring your best to your CSA, wholesale customers, or to the farmer's market, High Mowing has the professional quality seeds and supportive grower reps to get you from seed to harvest. Visit highmowingseeds.com to request a catalog and use NOTILL25, all caps, for 10% off your order of $100 or more. And now back to the show. So you're kind of answering this, but maybe you have like, a, you've been answering this all along, but so how should we as composters talk to our customers about PFAS? I mean, yeah, I think it's what I've already said, just like everything has PFAS in it. 
some fans have low, some fans have high. And like any one of you composters can point them to Black Earth's website where we have information on PFOS and we have a document and it shows, you know, our test results for the last four years and then compares it to test results from the soils in Maine. Yeah. And then the Mass Natural Fertilizer, you know, news article, which is, you know, total sh- article, terrible reporting. But like, you know, the the up in Maine, they had like a thousand PPA B mm-hmm. of PFOS and most of it was those bad six. And then Black Earth Compost were in the 30 to 50 range and we have zero of those bad six. You know, and then the mass natural was up near like 70 or 80, and it was mostly the, um, the like bad six. So it's just like, I think like we have a graph in there and it kind of like shows the difference because otherwise people don't realize that there's a difference between what they hear in the news and like what they're buying. Um, and we've also done tests on farms that have like used our compost year after year. And we don't find an accumulation in the soil. So I would say to composters, like, I think you guys should start testing Mm -hmm. and like releasing your data. Like, screw the lawyers who tell you like not to, you know, especially like the the municipal composters, they go to their town council and like, you know, three months later, town council gives them a response back. And it's they're like, oh, we're not required to test and don't test. It's like, screw that. Like, test it and let's, like, release it and let's start getting, like, the data out there so we can show that there are differences. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like that transparency. I always do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess the other thing I tell people is that they should be a lot more concerned about their household dust, Mm -hmm. like inhaling that directly onto their lungs, which are like a very porous membrane, than like, you know, putting compost in their soil, Mm -hmm. which, you know, that's a dilution. And then the plant only takes up so much. That's a dilution. Only so much goes into the fruit. That's another dilution. And then when you eat it, you know, Only so much crosses your gut barrier, which is a lot more, um, you know, resistant than your lungs. So, like, household dust has, like, like 250 ppb of uh, PFAS. Compost is, like, 30 to 40. And you're inhaling this dust directly into your lung. Like, be more concerned about that. You know, the world's contaminated. We've just all heard about the soil stories out of Maine. So um, how do you test? Like, is it a, like a sample that you send to a certain lab or are you testing the water or? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, and yeah, that's a good question because like composters, like don't be afraid of messing up testing. Like what we found is it's actually pretty easy to test. Um, like we, we've done duplicates and it comes back like, more or less the same and then year after year we're doing it and it's like more or less the same and like i've had you know one of my employees do it and like comes back the same as mine and like my car is like a pfas nightmare oh no you know because of the seats coated with everything yeah i had a can of pb blaster like go off in the in the car like six years ago yeah you know i'm like you know i have tools i'm like you know but like Despite that, I can like test PFAS and like get like duplicatable results with w- from other people. So how do you do it? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> all, all I'm saying is don't be afraid. Okay. Okay. I'm not um, afraid. You know, because they, they'll scare you too. Like, oh, don't bring a Sharpie. Don't bring rubber boots. And like, yeah, don't do that. But so usually um, a good lab, they'll send you PFAS free gloves and they'll send you a container. Right. And then... You know, so it's like, what do you use to te- to like take the sample? So I don't use um, like a tool per se because for cleaning it is like tough. But I'll just use the glove they give me. Okay. So I will, you know, make a little hole in the compost pile, and then I'll 
grab samples from around, like 10 grab samples, then I'll mix it up, you know, always using that one gloved hand, I'll mix it up in that hole, and then, and then I'll, you know, take a grab from that mixed up composite and put that in the container and close it up, and you're done. How big is that container? Just like a cup or something? Yeah, it's like a cup. Okay. Yeah. And then you want to send it in on ice, which like, I kind of, it doesn't make sense because the compost is like out baking in the sun, yep. you know, or it's like at room temperature, it's at 100 degrees. So to ice, it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah so, um, but nevertheless, you kind of follow their, their protocol. And uh, yeah, you send it in. And yeah, it's kind of expensive. It's like 300 bucks per sample. Yeah. And then I, I like to do a blank too. So they'll send you PFAS free water. And so I'll have someone help me where you like take your, you'll like run your, the PFAS free water over your glove before you sample and then get that in the container. So then that's kind of your blank because who, like there might be dust in the air or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And yeah, I'd say do a duplicate, have two p- different people do it. And then, once you've done it enough and your duplicates are coming back well, then it's like you can have confidence in it. I feel like the takeaways from this are that we all as composters should be testing because we don't even really know what a safe number is, but we know we're going to have a number. Yeah. Um, we can compare it to the high, super high number from Maine um, and just start getting some data. Yes. So that we can make better calls about how to approach this and ta- be transparent with our customers. You know, you know it is, it's going to be an education because it's, it's not going to be an exciting story, data collection and this. But um, I think a true education rather than a dramatic story is what we're going for. Yes, exactly. Well, we're, we're trying to like un- unveil what it is to like push back on those stories. And like, even at like USCC, like I heard a talk on PFAS last year and it like, it basically like ended with like, and there's PFAS and compost and like the bars and the bar graph went all the way to the top. It's like, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like compare that to something else in the world. Um, But I am happy USCC, they they put out like a, uh, sorry, US Compost uh, Council, they they put out like a little uh, business card that gives you like how much PFAS in household dust, how much is in um, oh, mascara. Yeah. yeah, actually, that'd be interesting. Like maybe we could all reach out to USCC and like see if we can get a uh, like stack of those business cards to give yeah. our... Um, to even have on our websites, yeah. you know, um, that information. Yeah. That's a really good idea because we're using, all of us are using, we are with it every day. So, Yeah. Um, great. Okay. So thank you for all that PFAS information. Um, this is actually, I'm throwing your own question back at you. You had talked about wanting to hear this question from other composters. So if you had to choose one tool on your desert island compost operation, what would it be? I think I said five tools. <laughs> I'm only letting you have one. <laughs> I have one tool. You can, um, you can have a, you can have a spare tool. Too. Desert island. So I don't need a multimeter because there's no like elevators to escape from or (laughs) something like that i'd say a flathead screwdriver okay tell me why uh it's just so useful for like (laughs) crying or like jabbing like open like a coconut or something um i don't know it's just a really great leverage tool (laughs) and then if like something does wash up like maybe you can open like you know something modern washes up maybe you can like open it up or (laughs) my hope is someday that every like mechanical interaction could be like you know taken care of with a flathead screwdriver go back in time to that yeah yeah yeah, well yeah we have to go (laughs) forward and like it's somehow an advancement going back yeah and then my second tool would be like a three pound hammer and that kind of complements the uh the flathead screwdriver okay all right (laughs) it's funny because you're you're like the green mountain technology stuff that you're working with is so great. It is like beep boop 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 boop, like uh, yeah. mysterious and wiry. And amazing. Uh, yeah. I don't think you can fix it with this flathead screwdriver. It's true, yeah. <laughs> but so cool, so so cool. I know, but like for the first ten years, you know, a flathead screwdriver. I think it was actually a railroad spike that was one of my more useful. <laughs> yeah. The railroad spike and the three pound hammer. Cool. Like when your tracks are frozen or something's frozen and like just caked with compost, like. Yeah. That's about your only option. Yep. Yep. I like a rubber mallet too. 
Cool. All right. Is there anything else you want to say to all your buddies here in the compost industry? Words of advice. I mean, you're deep in it. You you're, you guys have grown quickly, but methodically. But this past couple of years, you've really, really done a lot. I would say on compostable packaging, I'd like composters to continue to take it. I think it is a pathway forward for like like the homeowner for you know grocery stores like there's it it's useful like society needs containers like we can make these containers out of wood and out of like plant fibers and like we are the people who can like recycle that and like when a lot of these containers are messy and food soiled and like that is like so asking someone to wash it and like they can't even be recycled like that should go to compost it's not i think that is like composters should be able to recycle that um i think they're a source of carbon i think they add bulkiness to our piles um I know, you know, at the conference, there, the BPI and CMA conferences, some composters were like, oh, it adds nothing. I, I, I don't believe that. Okay. Um, I think, you know, also like trash is a big problem with us, like plastic trash, right? And like tr- this compostable plastics and compostable fiber, like that's going to replace that someday for food packaging. So I'm looking 20 years out that's when that stuff's replaced and you know we have like the stuff breaks down in our piles and like we need clear labeling at coming from the federal level like that was another takeaway from the conference we need clear labeling so consumers know what is recyclable and what is compostable you know when you have that and you have the compost bin as an option then i think it's a great solution for food contact packaging. I have a question because there's been potential for it to change. You know, our compost is um, OMRI listed, and so we're not, we can't take in the packaging, but there's talk of that changing. I don't, Was that talked about at the BPI conference? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's like, it's causing major problems in California. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. And I think that's okay. Okay. Um, You know, I, I think you can still make a high quality compost out of, uh, you know, food waste with compostable packaging. Yeah. Like you can make a organically certified compost out of like most manures from any like CAFO operation. Yeah. You know, like how great is that stuff? Mm-hmm. So, you know, but I think the organic board, you know, they, they do have to hold the line and like, cause they, they get a lot of criticism. So they do have to like preserve their like, you know, organic label um you know is there a middle ground probably mm-hmm. i don't know what that is um i'd like it'd be great if compostable packaging was allowed but i am skeptical it will happen all right this is awesome i really appreciate your time and seeing your your facility and your home welcoming me in here is so great to this compost community is the best it's so it's like we if it's true sharing and uh, and sharing is caring, and <laughs> I love the whole thing. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess that's another thing is just, you know, I, we are a small community and like, you know, it's not us versus each other. It's like us versus like, I, I think it's us versus anaerobic digestion. Mm-hmm. I think it's us versus like the, 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 meg, the mega haulers, mm-hmm. you know, like a lot of us are small haulers and uh you know what's going to happen when the waste managements and republics of the world start like hauling and taking the food waste to their solution mm-hmm. you know what's going to happen when anaerobic digestion comes for our nice big clean feedstocks like you know it's up to us to work together to like prove our model and say like this is you know this local decentralized model it's the lowest carbon footprint it's the best for our communities It builds our regional, you know, food networks. Like, let's make compost and get it out to the farms, like just outside the metropolitan areas. Let's build those soils. That makes it easier for the those farmers there to grow vegetables and feed back into the farms. 
I mean, if that's not like a like image of like true national strength, then I don't know what is. Yeah. You've seen it on my farm, like how it's made our field so much healthier and um, it's so great. It's so, so great. And and is it easier to farm? So much easier to farm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and more enjoyable. I'm and, not like fighting things. I'm celebrating this healthy isn't, soil. Isn't that the definition of resilience? Totally. You yeah. know, yeah. like people always throw out these terms like resilience and sustainable, like sustainable. It's the ability to sustain yeah. year after year. And if we're offering a solution that literally does that, like it takes the like, you know, the the like nebulous, like what do they mean by sustainable? What do they mean by resilience? It's like, this is what we mean. Are you going to be at the, the community compost conference coming up at the, it's the, towards the middle of October? Um, I, I, I didn't really know about it. Okay. All right. We'll talk about it. Um, it's, I think it might, registration might've closed already, but it's in Cleveland, I believe the 17th, 18th, 19th. Yeah. I'll, I'll be at USCC. Great. You know, that was really fun last year to see yeah. just how much the community has grown. But I'm probably tapped out with growing a, the CMA and the BPI conference. <laughs> yeah, but, you just got back from those. <laughs> yeah, that was fascinating. Though. Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on, Andrew. It's been an absolute pleasure. Andrew and I spoke after this interview, and he wanted me to add that the circular economy needs to make sure that what we are recirculating stays clean. Certification for compostable packaging is how Andrew believes we will do that because it puts standards, like for PFAS, on that packaging. Andrew believes the current certifiers, BPI, CMA, and TUV, are the flag bearers that we should follow to achieve this clean, circular economy. Andrew encourages composters to accept compostable packaging certified by them. I want to thank Andrew, Sarah, Little Levon, and Baby Norm for having me over, and I can't wait for our pool date next summer. Check out Black Earth Compost at blackearthcompost.com and check the show notes for other links to learn about PFAS. As always, thank you to No-Till Growers for making this possible. All our sponsors, the awesome music of Soul Shop, Mother Earth, Ja, Buddha, God, and all that allows for this fun career. And especially you, our compost-loving listeners. Listeners.